On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, International Naturism. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener. It's episode 49, and it's been four years since I started this little project. You know, I started this hoping to go maybe a year or two, but I don't seem to be running out of topics. So uh, after four years, we've, uh, well, we've set some pretty incredible records and numbers. I remember after the second year, near the end of the second year, I was very excited because with the first 24 or so episodes, I had over 100,000 downloads of total over two years. Well, we're actually, um, we're exceeding that in a month. In the month of October, we had 198,013 downloads. And uh, we've already exceeded that for the month of November. I'm recording this in November, not at the end. And that means that we're doing, well, we've done over 1 million downloads just in this last year, in a year number four. And we're now entering the fifth year, because with this podcast, with episode 49, we're uh, in November of 2012, and that's the fourth year is now done. And uh, just last year, we've done over a million downloads. That's basically million listeners, because every time somebody downloads the podcast, they are probably listening to it. It's a fairly large download, as you know. And uh, a download is uh, of an audio-only podcast means it's people who are interested in the uh, topic. Um, now, perhaps people are downloading them and not listening to them. That's certainly possible. Uh, even if only half of them are actually listening to the entire podcast, that's 100,000 downloads. That's 100,000 people listening, 100,000 individuals who are interested in the message we're talking about and that's that's quite humbling and i'm uh, i thank you for listening i I really appreciate the fact that you're enjoying the uh, show i'm putting it on i mean i'm talking from the heart i'm talking about what i believe in um i'm not trying to appeal to everyone because as everyone knows who's been listening for a while i have some pretty strong views about what naturism should be about and what it really means and uh I'm not trying to do something to be populist or appeal to everyone. I'm trying to present one view of naturism, uh, my view and the view of the many guests and people that we've brought on over the last four years. So thank you for being interested. Thank you for sending comments. Thank you for continuing to encourage me. Um, And thank you for continuing to follow the path of uh, true ethical naturism. I announced the uh, trip to Montalivet, CHM, the Centre Elio Marin de Montalivet. Um, that was the topic of my last podcast, episode 48. And uh, so that is continuing. We still don't have pricing at the time that I'm doing this, but by the time you go to the uh, show website to click on the link to find out more information about um, the, uh, the trip for next July... Um, there's hopefully going to be pricing. We're very close. We're just negotiating back and forth, trying to get the best possible pricing for the 50 spaces that are available on this trip. Um, I've already announced that we had a 20% discount on accommodations at Montalivet, and we're just now negotiating a group rate for the uh, train portion and the uh, plane portion, as well as the trip. Uh, par- uh, part that happens in Paris because at the end of the one week in Montalivet we're going to spend three nights two full days in Paris visiting Paris and there's going to be tour and stuff included and that includes accommodations so we're just finalizing negotiations so by the time you click on it hopefully unless you listen perhaps at the very first day that the show is available but hopefully at that point uh, if you're a little later in the Uh, At the end of November or beginning of December, we'll have some finalized pricing up there on the webpage as well. So go to the webpage for The Naturist Living Show, which is naturistliving.bearoaks.ca. 
And uh, if you go to that the podcast notes for this episode number 49, there will be a link to the uh, page that has all the details and the travel agent contact information and all that. Because even if you're not in Toronto, the pricing will be for Toronto and Montreal departures. If you want to have departure information or organize a trip from wherever you are, we can certainly work with you if you contact the travel agent that's listed on that page. So I really look forward to uh, seeing several of you, if, if that's possible, meeting some of you on the trip to uh, the Bordeaux region of France and Montalivet and Paris. Speaking of Montalivet, um, the uh, third international congress, international congress was uh, held there in 1953. It was the third one. The first one was held in the UK in 1951. The second one in Switzerland in 1952. And these were gatherings where everybody from around the world were invited. And it's at the third one, after two years of planning, that they formed the... Uh, the International Naturist Federation in 1953. And it was, so it was formed in Montalivet. Next year, if uh, you're going, or when we will be there, at least, or when I'll be there, will be the 60th anniversary of the International Naturist Federation. And I was in Croatia in September of this year, September 2012, for the 33rd International Naturist Federation Congress. It's held every two years. And uh, this year it was in Koversada, uh, which is uh, in Versar, Croatia. And uh, Koversada was the, uh, the site of a, a previous Naturist Federation Congresses in the 70s. Um, and it's, it's a, it, one of the first Naturist va- vacation destinations. Um, certainly, Montalivet is older, but it was one of the first commercial centers. And it was built in the old Yugoslavia. Um, because Yugoslavia saw a real opportunity with uh, nature's tourism and many, many large resorts. I talked about how large Montalivet is, and Coversado is on that same scale with th- over 3,000 campsites and villas that you can go and stay at. It's very affordable. It's on Andri- the uh, Adriatic, which is a part of the uh, uh, Mediterranean Ocean uh, the, that's between Italy and um, the, the rest of the mainland of Europe, and the most of that coast in facing Italy, is Croatia. And near the top part on the Istrian Peninsula is the, uh, the resort of Coversada. And uh, it was my second time there. I was at the uh, Congress, uh, was it 2004? Anyway, it was in Croatia as well, at Valalta. And it's a beautiful part of uh, the world. It's, it's hot, it's arid, um, lots of olive trees. It's a very Mediterranean um, Reminds me a lot of uh, Italy because a lot of uh, the architecture is very similar to Italy. It was ruled by Italy for many centuries. Um, it was part of the Venetian Empire. And you can see that in some of the ruins and the history and uh, the, the way that the, the villages are built um, and, and the architecture. Beautiful here. But the uh, business there was the uh, gathering, the every two years, of uh, all of the countries, or as many countries as we as could make it. Um, there were 22 countries represented at this Congress, this 33rd Congress in, in, in uh, Coversada. And um, I was uh, very honored to be elected to the uh, Central Committee um, of the uh, International Naturist Federation. As you probably know, I was president and uh, director of the Federation of Canadian Naturists. I uh, president for about 10 years and director for about 15. I've now given that up uh, because I've had a little too much to do with Bear Oaks and uh, promoting naturism that way. But this was uh, something that uh, I was asked if I was interested and I'm certainly always willing to serve in uh, the naturist community and help where I can. So I am a member of the Central Committee. Um, My official responsibilities are um, for the non-European parts of the world that I represent. I'm the contact point. And uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, With distance, uh, it's a bit challenging, but with technology today and the ability to have uh, web conferences and telephone even being inexpensive and email and document sharing and all that... It should be quite manageable, and but uh, I'll still be having to go 
to Europe a few times a year, which is a terrible thing to do, of course. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that part, I, of course. Uh, but it will be a lot of work. And uh, so if anyone has any issues or concerns um, that uh, you think want, you want brought up to the International Nature's Federation, um, do let me know. Uh, do contact me, and I'll see what I can do to help you. The, um, the Congress was an interesting event uh, because the Congress is very much like the UN. I often describe it to my textile friends like this. Imagine the UN with delegates from every country sitting around a table with little flags and country names and uh, discussing issues of international uh, scope um, with simultaneous translation in multiple languages, except the uniform is a little different. Everybody's nude. Well, most people are nude. It was a little chilly this time, so a lot of people were wearing clothes in the beginning. But in principle, everyone's nude, and that's the uniform. And uh, it uh, there's a lot of talking going on. I also say that, like the UN, the uh, the INF, the International Nature's Federation, doesn't doesn't accomplish a lot. Uh, nor does the UN. And yet, I think it's a very important body. Because it's very hard to get anywhere uh, when you're talking about uh, issues of international scope. You have language issues, you have cultural issues, which make it very complicated to discuss things. Um, just it's, it's hard to imagine unless you've experienced it, but as somebody is speaking, um, you are waiting to react, you're waiting for a translation to happen. Uh, the INF has three official languages, which, is, which are German, uh, French and English, and occasionally the speaker um, doesn't speak any of those, so they have their own translator to help at the same time. So you can imagine there can be quite a delay before you actually know what they're saying, which makes the debate and discussion somewhat challenging. And then, of course, there's also the possibility of translation is not correct or accurate. And then even if it is technically correct, there are cultural differences where we have sometimes trouble understanding each other. I remember a number of years ago that I was in one such debate where they were discussing conferring special status on clubs, and uh, I wasn't really understanding why they were debating it or why they wanted to give special status to clubs. Um, and I was listening to the original speakers, the native speakers in French and English, because I can speak both of those languages. I had to listen to the uh, German trans, uh, translation for the German. Um, but I still wasn't understanding what the debate was. Everybody seemed to be sort of agreeing and disagreeing at the same time. Until I realized that culturally, in places like France, a club is always nonprofit. Whereas here in North America, in Canada, uh, Bear Oaks, it is a club because you can be a member. But it is privately held. And in France, it would never be called a club if it was privately held. Uh, in France, a club is always associative, owned by the members and therefore non-profit, which is why some people thought it, when they, with that definition that they should be given special uh, attention, special uh, consideration because they were non-profit and owned by the members, which is a valid debatable point. But the interesting part was because it was so uh, such a cultural concept, the word was the right translation, but the cultural concept was the same, we weren't understanding each other. So that's just one example, and I'm sure the same thing happens at the uh, UN, where culture and uh, the frame of reference that people look at things from is very different, vastly different, regardless of language, and then you add language. So it's very inefficient, and uh, it, which is why a lot doesn't get done. And you have to remember that the INF is actually a, an association of associations, so they don't actually re directly represent naturists, they represent Nature's Federation, one per country. So it's not a very efficient body, but it's a very important one because it, what, it's what brings us together. It's what makes us an international movement. It allows us to talk. And every time I go to one of these congresses, and I would invite any of you to go on the next one, everyone is welcome. Even if you're not an official delegate, you're, you can go and listen and sit and participate. Um, but... Every time I go, I get new ideas. I have interesting discussions, fascinating discussions. Because, you know, the only thing that all naturists have in common around the world is uh, an acceptance of, of nudity and, and, and 
and comfort with the body and human body. I mean, the definition may be the same, but of course, there's very big differences even locally. You know, clubs that are clothing optional, clubs that where people believe in naturism just being uh, recreational opportunities, or or even federations viewing it that way. It's very often typical in Europe in a naturist resort that people dress for dinner because that's the fashion. I think they've lost the original meaning of what naturism was about. And certainly in Montalivet, I saw a lot of people getting dressed for dinner. But when I read the writings and ideas of the founders of Montalivet, I know they have the same ideas as I do of an ethical naturism where you don't wear clothes unless you absolutely have to. You never wear clothes because it is a trend or fashion. But Montalivet, like all large resorts, and we discussed this in the last show, is subject to those pressures. So the INF is important because it keeps us talking. It keeps us sharing ideas. It gives a huge amount of credibility to the movement as well. So the, the federations make up the membership of the INF, uh, not the individual naturists. And then the federations, every two years, in a general assembly, elect uh, an executive committee and a central committee. Uh, I am part of the central committee, a member of the central committee. It sounds like something out of old uh, communism and USSR, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, that's the official terms of this, the, the central committee, which I am part of, which meets uh, two, three times a year. The executive committee is more responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs, and that's the presidents and vice presidents and treasurer. And uh, the general secretariat which is the office, which only has a, uh, an employee and it's a half-time employee, as it is, uh, is located in Austria. And that's where it's coordinating and translating. Because you got to remember, everything that is produced, that is shared, has to be translated into at least three languages. And that information goes back and forth between all the member federations. It keeps people connected. The president of the INF is uh, Sieglinde Ivo. And uh, she has been for a number of years, and uh, I, uh, she speaks English pretty well for uh, an Austrian. But uh, in discussing it with the vice president, Mick Ayers, um, who is British, we decided that interviewing somebody about the INF would best be done with him because, uh, obviously, his native language is English. So I sat down with uh, Mick Ayers, and uh, I asked him what the INF was all about. Um, I'm Mick Ayres and my position is now Vice Chairman of the uh, INF. So I'm in charge of the Secretariat, which is the Office and the Administrative Functions of the INF. So what is the INF? Well, the INF is the World Organization for Naturism. It's an organization which brings together national federations in over 30 countries and seven, uh, uh, we call them correspondents, they're embryo federations in uh, other countries. And the idea is to coordinate activities worldwide, uh, to help and advise in establishing new areas for naturism and generally to promote naturism amongst the unknowing public. And it's made up of a federation, and how would you describe a federation then? A federation can be, uh, well, it is go going to be a group of uh, organisations, usually at least four, sometimes many hundreds. Uh, it can be clubs, swimming organisations, organised beach groups, uh, commercial organisations such as holiday centres, and even travel agents who specialise in naturist activities. Those would come together within one country to form a committee, we insist on it being some kind of democratic structure where people have a vote and can choose their, their officers. And then it has the authority to act as the INF agent within that country. It sells stamps, holiday, holiday cards, it gives information, and usually it involves membership of a federation in that country as well. So there's only one federation per country? Uh, we only accept one official federation per country. It is possible within some countries, with the permission of the existing federation, to have what we call extraordinary members, which are smaller groups, uh, again, working on the same basis, but depends. It could be a regional structure, for example, where there may be autonomous governments within a, a national uh, federation. And uh, those organisations can also sell stamps and memberships and uh, act on behalf of INF. What they can't do is have any voting power in our general assemblies or in our policy making. So do you ever have a situation where there's uh, more than one federation? And if there is, how do you handle it? 
Well, we don't have that because it's up to the INF internationally to recognise the federations. So we can't actually have a situation where there are two federations. We can have a situation where there are two groups vying to be the federation, and then it's a matter of looking at what is the most suitable, the most uh, close to our statutes and accepting the rules of naturism. Uh, wherever possible, we'd attempt to bring those sides together in some way, uh, perhaps by acting as an honest arbiter in the middle, uh, advising, taking advice from both sides and guiding them so that perhaps we could form one federation. But ultimately, if uh, push comes to shove and we have to recognise a single federation, then clearly we recognise the most suitable and able one for naturism. Does the INF have uh, an office? The INF does have an office, a secretariat based in Linz in Austria. It's a very small office. Uh, we have one employee and uh, the rest of the work is done by volunteers. So what's the history? How did this start? It started with groups of people, I will say people, because some of them were already in what we know term as federations. Others were perhaps individuals who organised naturism in various countries and they came together in, uh, in southern France, in Montalivet, in 1953 and thought that it would be a good idea to have a world organisation which could represent naturism and be seen as the official body. Uh, and they formed, therefore, the International Naturist Federation. It uh, then tried to define what they considered naturism and they came with the original def definition of naturism being uh, naturism is something that's healthy for mind and body, involving respect for oneself, respect for others and respect for the environment. Uh, now those definitions have varied slightly depending on the translations in countries but are generally held good and it's also accepted that uh, that involves and this is sometimes difficult. Communal nudity is the general definition of this. Now, of course, it is recognised that that could mean nudity in common. In other words, groups of people being naked together or holding the values of naturism in common uh, so that perhaps people who practice nudity in their own homes, in their own gardens, have a respect for naturism and can be naturists, but not necessarily uh, within clubs or organisations where they meet large groups of other people. So the, um, the INF, I've been involved with the INF for about 10 years now, and uh, it seems like for 10 years there's been different federations who have questioned whether there's a r real purpose for the INF and whether it really is necessary. And most recently, two years ago, uh, the American Association for Nude Recreation decided that uh, they really had no need for the INF. Um, obviously, you don't agree or you wouldn't be volunteering your time to do it. Why do you think it's important to have the INF? I think uh, we've seen the situation developing since 1953 that, that the world is getting smaller with telecommunications as they are with organisations, multinational organisations, a clear need for a nat uh, national bodies. Uh, they can't reach outside their borders. They can't control things that happen. Decisions are taken, laws are made. We have European commissions, for example, you know, making laws for Europe. Uh, we have all kinds of structures coming together uh, when they're talking about financial matters uh, and the way in which the world is run. And it's important, therefore, that naturism isn't left behind, that it actually does take a, a stance. It's in a position to do so, and it needs a world organisation to do that. Uh, many organisations have shown that unless you have a very strong world organisation, you, nature is united throughout the world, uh, together we're very, very strong, but in separate federations, in separate countries, our voices are, and we have to face it, a minority. They always will be, uh, certainly at least for the foreseeable future. It's therefore important to have the structures that at least mirror what the rest of the world is, is uh, going through. It, it would be impossible to see a situation without some kind of world recognition of naturism. That's what we strive for. Yes, it's difficult in many countries. In many countries it's completely illegal or against their beliefs. But we still see groups of people wanting to form naturist organisations, wanting to form naturist uh, structures. Uh, they need support and help. It may be very strong in a particular country. Naturism may well be accepted in certain countries, and it is. But elsewhere, they need help. Uh, and surely we are all human beings. That's the whole philosophy of naturism. There's no difference between us. That's why our communal nudity doesn't make any difference to us. We're all the same, and we have to support each other and work for each other. That's something INF can do internationally. It's not something individual countries can do. There are all kinds of reasons why they can't become involved in perhaps the politics or the religious activities or the structures of an alternative country. The, um, 
and, and we're here for the uh, the INF Congress, which is held every two years. This is uh, well. Can you tell us a little bit about this particular Congress? Uh, this Congress is going to be much like many others. It's about the policies of the INF uh, and the way in which they run. The federations actually are able to give control to that. That's the, their job. That's why we're democratic. They will elect a national, international executive. Uh, at the moment, there are two seats available on that for the treasurer and the president, and we have candidates for that. And there's also what we call a central committee, which is a sort of check and balance committee with the executive working together. They come together several times a year to discuss what the INF is doing and run the internal business of the INF. The Congress will also discuss policy matters where they think they can be improved or directions they think we should be taking, campaigns we should be embarking upon, or indeed hearing reports on how far we've considered uh, progress with other campaigns. So it's a general assembly which is really like many other international meetings where people are reporting what they're doing to their committee structures, reporting back and receiving instructions for the future. Uh, it's just part of the democratic process and we obviously have to go through this, we expect to go through it and we can answer questions, we can give advice and we can launch a few things that uh, we are now embarking on which is a complete revamp of our international website uh, so that uh, www.infffni.org is going to be a new website, uh, much more dynamic, much more interactive, uh, and we're sure that it's going to be an absolute source of information for the entire world on infom and information for naturism. It's the place to go if you want to know anything about naturism. So there's a lot of technical reasons for this Congress to be happening. Do you think there's also value in having this every two years? Uh, yes, I think there's a tremendous value in having it because whilst I say technically the world is small, we still have people living a long distance apart. They can't get together very regularly. Uh, and yes, there's the business end of the, uh, the meetings where we have to discuss things formally and we have to go through formal structures, approve accounts and balances and things like this. Uh, the kind of boring thing, I think, if you really want to be honest. But it has to be done. It's important that it takes place. But there's also the aspect of people can get together from different countries. They can get together over a drink in the evenings, for example, or a meal at lunchtime, uh, or a coffee in the morning, and discuss matters of common interest even between two or three countries. So the kind of exchange of ideas and information that can take place in these is completely invaluable. So you've been involved for a long time in naturism and the INF and uh, federations. What do you think of the future of naturism? Is it... Uh, is it growth? Is it stability? Is it gloom and doom? And it's just bound to fail. It's definitely not bound to fail. Uh, in my view, it's improving. I mean, the, the things I am seeing is that people are coming together. There's more organisation taking place. It depends on a national situation. Yes, there are countries where nothing's changing. Many of them probably reach the growth that they could possibly achieve and probably are not going to get any bigger. But worldwide... There's a tremendous interest in naturism, and there's many, many countries yet that would love to be involved in naturism. We're even getting many approaches from governments who see the tremendous advantages of nature's tourism. It's absolutely incredibly valuable to them. It brings money and income to them, and naturists, because of their respect for the environment, bring very little damage to those countries, uh, far less than the commercial tourism that's generally exploited. So there is a great future for naturism. Uh, it's a great level of, of mankind as well because uh, there's an equality in nudity. Uh, as always said, an army fights very badly with no trousers, and that's very true. Without our clothes, we're all equal. So it has a great future, and a great future for mankind. Now, the biggest federation... Uh, in the INF is the uh, Dutch Federation. There are many federations, but the Dutch are by far the biggest, and it's based on the number of members. Um, it's not based on the population of the country or the economic power, which is interesting, because you don't think of the Netherlands as a particularly uh, a biggest country in any particular thing, except perhaps a beer. So I'm having a Dutch beer right now, so to all Dutch people out there, or my Dutch friends who are listening... Cheers, I'm having a Heineken. So you, perhaps you're number one in terms of beer. Although being half Belgian, I must say, Belgian beers are pretty great too. But anyway, I, uh, the Dutch Federation is, uh, is a fascinating uh, corporation because it has many, many staff and, and large uh, membership base and employees. 
And uh, what's interesting, though, is despite the fact they have more votes, the founders of the INF did take into consideration that they would be some very large federation. And they organized a number of votes um, to uh, the, the calculation for how the number of votes that each federation gets to disadvantage the large federations. Not completely. There's no question that the Naturist Federation is a very, very large one in terms of votes as well. Uh, with about 60,000 members, they have 34 votes. But what's interesting is um, a, a federation with 1,000 uh, members would have four votes. And a federation with double that, 2,000 members, would only have six votes. And that's because they use an exponential uh, uh, progression in order to calculate votes. And it's a little complicated, but uh, quite brilliant if you think about it. The, uh, you take the total amount, uh, that, the total number of members that each uh, federation has paid for each year, uh, for two years, and then you take that total and you divide it by 100, and from that you take the square root. There's a minimum of one. You have to have at least one vote. But by taking the square root, it means that a uh, federation with 2,000 members gets six votes, but a federation with 10 times as many, 20,000 members, only gets 20 votes. So it's a very... Um, uh, cons it, it, very democratic in some ways in that it tries to take into consideration not just the economic power of a federation or how successful they are at running their affairs, but it does give them credit if they are very successful, they do get more votes. So with that, I, uh, I've known uh, Bernd Heuser for a number of years. Um, he's been at several of the congresses that I've attended. And I sat down with him to learn a little bit more about uh, what uh, naturism is like in the Netherlands. I am Berend Huizer. I'm Dutch and I'm working for the Dutch Naturist Federation. I've been working for the Federation now for over 12, 13 years perhaps. And at this moment, my main task is to lobby with authorities and then you have to think of municipalities mainly in order to improve or get the number of public nude speeches in Holland increased. And is uh, the Dutch Federation, is that a small federation or a big federation? Mm, we're a rather big federation when you compare to other countries. First of all, out of recent research appears that one out of nine, ten Dutchmen has a habit of recreating in the nude. That's to say they either go to a nude beach or they just lay naked in their garden. And 43,000, no, I have to correct that, 63,000 of them are directly affiliated to the Dutch Federation, either as a club member, one third of them, two thirds directly to the Federation. So I would imagine that means that you have a fairly hefty budget and you are not just volunteers. Um, that's, that's correct. In, in fact, we, we do have, um, well, it's strange when I say it, but we pre pretend to be a professional office um, with, with nine employees. In, in fact, the work of the Federation is mainly done by professional people. Um, whereas the clubs are concerned, the clubs that are affiliated to the Federation, they for 90% are depending on volunteers. We as a Federation uh, have the luck, the opportunity to work with professionals. So I'm probably one of the few people at this Congress that's being paid for being present here. Well, that's great. So oh, <laughs> what, uh, what services does the Federation provide to its members? The thing that our members expect most of us is that we give them information where to spend their naturist holidays. And in fact we don't do that only to our members but also to the visitors of our website who are, most of them are not affiliated. So as an extra for our members we provide a magazine that's only available for members and uh, which appears in uh, 40,000 copies each, four times a year. And also we try to um, give them 
all kinds of discounts or advantages whenever they show the membership cards when they go on a holiday or go to a wellness resort or whatever. And that's the main service that we provide to our members and that's what they expect from us. And uh, how did that happen? Did, like all federations, I imagine it started out very small. So how did it grow to be so big? I'm not really sure if I know or if we know. Uh, I think when you look at the Dutch mentality, it has, to be, it has been rather tolerant or liberal when you compare it to other parts of the world, especially during the 70s, 80s, whereas in that period, uh, naturism was largely spread. And whereas a lot of people took the first initiatives to really occupy the first beaches just in order to be naked, just to be able to recreate in the nude. I mean, legislation at that point was not so far that there was the opportunity. So the first pioneers among the naturists really um, fought their way up onto the beaches and on a larger scale. And before that, starting from the 50s, I would say, smaller amounts of people had gathered already and bought themselves pieces of land where they founded the first camping sites, the first clubs, in fact. And at this moment, in Holland, we have about 50 clubs that still exist. Now, the Dutch weather is not quite Canadian weather, but it's still not Spanish or Italian weather either. Um, how, how do Dutch people practice naturism? It's fairly cool often, is it not? And listen who's speaking, it's a Canadian, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's true, but, but um, I must say, even now, nowadays, when you go to... We, we have a very long period, in fact, where with a little enthusiasm or personally spoken sometimes, fanatical uh, mentality, people really can go naked from April until se late September sometimes. And obviously when you go to, and I'm talking again about the nude beaches, uh, when you visit those nude beaches, really from April until October sometimes you will find their uh, visitors. It's um, Knows most of the time it are the naturists who are finishing and starting the season. They are more enthusiastic, more fanatic than the clothing, clothed uh, uh, tourists. So for Canadians, you know, they might think of going to the Mediterranean for a naturist holiday, um, but they could come to Holland. So what would you recommend if anybody's thinking they might like to come to the Netherlands for a nature's holiday? Well, already today I noticed, for me already, today it was rather cold. And the opening of the Congress was today. And what I noticed is that most of the Europeans were really dressed, whereas the Canadian delegation today was fully naked. So I guess that your standards already are lower or higher, I don't know what to say in this matter, but anyway are different than ours. So I would say if Canadians, if uh, listeners are interested in visiting the Netherlands, I would surely recommend them the period from May until late August to visit the country. Then you have the most chance for good temperatures. And temperatures in summertime can vary, or even in spring, from 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. And from, uh, for people who don't know the geography, which areas of the Netherlands would you recommend? It depends what you're looking for. If you are really interested in visiting a club, then you can find them all over the country. And the middle of the country is the most populated part, populated part of the country. So I would recommend the outer parts of the country. 
as you go are interested in visiting nude beaches, I uh, would say about 80% of the nude beaches are on our coastline. And that will be for them, for those people, the most interesting part to visit. And of course, even when you're on the coastline, you can still visit Amsterdam. It's not too far away. Um, no. I mean, still you have to pick out the good part of the coastline. But even then, Amsterdam is always without, uh, within uh, 30 to 70 kilometers in reach of the coastline. So that would be perfect. But on the other hand, Rotterdam is also a very, for people, those who are interested in visiting cities, Rotterdam, one of the main harbors in Europe, is also um, a very interesting city, whereas Amsterdam has all to offer on all the modern things, modern architecture you can find in Rotterdam. And also those cities are within 50, 60 kilometers reach within each other, so that's no problem at all. So what do you think the future holds for naturism in the Netherlands? Polls are showing that still a lot of people are interested in naturism. And I mentioned already one out of eight, nine people are practically or are practicing new recreation, so that's not bad at all. Um, so, from that perspective, our future is not so bad. When it comes to attaining members or getting new members for the Federation, and that's of course also interesting for me, apart from my ideal idealism, it's also interesting because it's my job. Um, I think we have to work very hard in order to maintain this, the numbers that we are having now. Because, generally spoken, when people in, in Europe, are, at least in Holland, are getting less interest in committing themselves to um, unions or to any kind of federations at all. I mean, people are getting more and more individual, and we as a federation have to work on it that we keep on changing or renewing our services so that we can keep people interested in what we are offering. Well, that's all for this episode of The Naturist Living Show. Thank you again for listening. Remember to check out our trip to Montalivet uh, for next summer by uh, going to our webpage where there is a link to uh, the, the, the page with the, the trip details as well as links to all of the other items that have been mentioned in the show. So the website is located at naturistliving.bareoaks.ca. That's naturist living, naturist living, one word, dot bare oaks, B-A-R-E, of course, dot C-A for Canada. Please keep sending in your comments and your suggestions and sometimes your questions. I appreciate getting them all and I try to reply to every one of them. The show's email address is naturistliving at bare oaks dot C-A, B-A-R-E-O-A-K-S dot C-A for Canada. My name is Stéphane Deschain, and I was your host for this podcast, and I'm the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park, and I hope you'll join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park, traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca.
Thank you.